Good evening, everybody. My name is Akbar, and we're going to start talking about the reliability of the NYC subway system. So, as you may or may not know, the, the New York City subway is the largest rapid transit system in the world. It has over 400 stations, 27 subway lines, and every, uh, on average, 5.5 million people ride the trains every weekday. In the last year, the MTA has serviced uh, 1.7 billion riders. But there's a problem. The, the, the MTA is an old institution. Our, our subway system began operation in 1904. And as you can see, this is a very old picture, obviously. And this track no longer exists, but it started a long time ago. Our equipment is kind of dated. Some of it is at least 80 years old. And even though this track no longer exists, um, this is on Greenwich Street, uh, there's actually a line that services near that area, the E-Train. So the subway has been a crucial part of our infrastructure, and uh, because it's running on dated equipment, we've had a lot of recent coverage of how often the MTA has kind of failed, how it's, there's a crisis of, uh, of infrastructure, the subway's late and causing New Yorkers to be late. But all of these things kind of look at, uh, look at the subway on an, on an average level. And as you might know, a lot of you are data scientists here, um, averages are misleading. <laughs> And so we wanted to we specifically call out one article where uh, the, the article talks about the on-time rates for the trains, but one thing that's kind of strange is that on-time rates aren't really use, a useful metric for all of us because when was the last time you pulled out a schedule to know when your train was going to show up? You just come to the subway and you expect it to work on time and reliably. So when we were looking at the data, we wanted to answer research questions that kind of made sense to us personally and on an individual level. So stuff like, how long do I have to wait for my next train? If I have several routes that I can take, which one is the best? What's better, subway or car? What are the worst places based on where my job is? If I couldn't take my regular train, how does that change my overall commute? And how are commutes different for people with disabilities or lower incomes? So... Um, the thing that made this possible was that you might have noticed these countdown clocks showing up in all of the stations. As of January of this year, there's a countdown clock in every, uh, in every subway station uh, in the MTA. And it, it might just seem like it's just another edition of a clock telling us when the trains are coming. But up until these were up, we had no idea where, where exactly where trains were at any given time. And now, because of some, uh, some uh, hardware magic with... Bluetooth receivers, Wi-Fi transmitters, and even on the uh, on the numbered lines, some track uh, track modifications. We have a better approximation of where trains are at any given moment. This MTA data feed is updated by the minute, and so we collected uh, every train every minute for five months of data. And we have to, we want to give a big shout out to Todd Schneider, who's a data scientist at Genius who kind of helped us uh, get, get a leg up because he cleaned all of this data for us to use. And that's 23 million data points, one, uh, one mil, uh, roughly a million trains. So this is what our data set looked like. We have the real-time trip ID, which uh, talks to any one particular train from beginning to end. We have the stop MTA ID, which refers to a specific station. We have the route MTA ID, which is just a line. We have the direction, one and three. One is north, three is south. And on east and west, one is east, uh, three is south, uh, west. Uh, then we have the departure time, when the train left the station, and the seconds until the next departure. But even with all this data, we still have some problems because, uh, b because the, there, this data wasn't, one, this data wasn't meant for us to do research with. But also, there are some problems with the infrastructure. So countdown clocks can only give us approximate locations. And as you might have read in the news, uh, they're, they're, they're sometimes also inaccurate. Some other weird things that we found in the data were that trains would disappear and reappear, and we had to figure out which, you know, we had to re rearrange them, as well as trips getting rerouted all the time. A couple of interesting notes was when, 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 when we looked at the data, we also saw some trains go backwards in time. So this is one F train going from Ditmas Avenue to Avenue N. And you might notice that between 18th Avenue and Avenue I, the departure time actually went backwards. So this, this train is a time traveler. And another thing that we noticed was that occasionally, uh, on one line specifically, we found that east and west uh, switches directions. So the MTA couldn't really decide which way was east. 
And so as you'll notice on this top, uh, this top data right up here, it's an E-train going from JFK to Forest Hills, which is definitely not east. And at some point, and this is what the MTA's compass looked like, which you might know is wrong. And they they realized this mistake three months into three months into the uh, the data feed. So around March 23rd, the MTA actually flipped a switch, and all the trains that were originally showing up as east were now correctly showing up as west, and other trains, well, the east trains, are showing up as east again. So JFK, Forest Hills. The order is a little misleading, but the departure time makes sense. So you start at Forest Hills, going east towards JFK. And now I'm going to hand it off to Brian, who's going to talk about some extra work we had to do to do further analysis with wait times. Thank you, Akbar. Hi, I'm Brian, uh, and I'm going to be talking about wait times. So uh, from that data we looked at earlier, you can see that we have a little field called seconds until next departure. Uh, what that means is basically the number of seconds between two subsequent trains. Uh, and that's not... That's a really, really powerful piece of data, but that's not exactly what commuters care about, right? Commuters, what they care about is, when I arrive at a station, how long do I have to wait before the next train? And that sounds like the same thing, but it's not really. And to illustrate that, we're going to use a little toy example right here, where uh, imagine that you're at a station, and a train arrives after four minutes, and then after that train, another train arrives after two minutes. I just wanted to quickly ask the audience, what do you think the average wait time at this station for an individual is? You can just shout it out. One and a half. Three minutes. I, I heard an interesting number, three minutes, which is uh, the average time between the two trains. Uh, between, yeah. Um, and that sounds like it should be right, but it's not actually three minutes. It's a little bit trickier than you might imagine, uh, and it involves like a few assumptions that we have to make. So if we assume, like, like one of the problems is we don't know exactly when people arrive at the station, uh, but if we assume that a person arrives at the station every minute, uh, here are some fine gentlemen that arrive every minute, <laughs> we, we can check the amount of time that they'll have to wait. So this guy right over here has to wait four minutes, this guy three, two, one, two, one. And with these values, we can plot a distribution of the wait times, uh, which is this little distribution right here, where we have people stacked, you know, just like reality. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and we can get an understanding of the amount of people that experience each wait time. So you can see that it's more likely that you'll experience a wait time of one or two minutes right here. Uh, and in the worst case, you'll experience like three or four minutes. But what is the average? If we take these values and take the average of it, we actually end up with 2.2 minutes, which is really interesting. But that's not working with the real data. But this is something we can do with the real data, and we end up with a distribution like this. So we took the Times Square uh, station on the Uptown train, uh, Uptown 1 train, uh, and we got this distribution using the same kind of assumptions. And we can see right here this line is the median. Uh, and what that means is 50% of the time at this station when you're waiting for the Uptown 1 train, you will be waiting around five minutes. Right here is the 10th percentile, where 10% uh, of the time you'll be waiting around one minute, under one minute. And right here is the 90th percentile, where 90% of the time you'll be waiting under 13.5 minutes. Uh, but another way to say that is 10% of the time you'll be waiting over 13.5 minutes. And that's kind of like our worst case, kind of like a working definition for our worst case using the trains. But what about night, uh, day versus night? What about rush hour? Surely the wait time changes uh, as the hour of the day changes, right? Like, uh, you, you would imagine that at night, like, there are service changes, and that makes the expected wait time kind of change. Uh, so to talk about that, I wanted to talk about a little personal commute of one of the people that uh, are in this program, uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> so every day I have to take the train from Manhattan all the way to Flushing. So I take the 7 train, uh, which goes right uh, from the city to Flushing. Uh, and... Using that distribution from earlier, we can kind of gain an understanding of how the median and the 90th percentile changes as the hour of the day changes. So we can plot uh, those values as the, as the time of day changes. So on the x-axis, we have the hour of the day. And on the y, we have the, the wait times from that distribution. And this little dark line is the median. So if I could pick a point, like 8 AM, we can see that I have to wait around like 2.5 minutes, 
50% of the time, and the 90th percentile right here, I have to wait around six or seven minutes. Uh, and we can contrast that time, 8 a.m., with like 3 a.m., you know, say I'm partying and <laughs> I end up commuting at 3 in the morning using the 7 train. We can see that um, the median time is around 10 minutes and the 90th percentile is almost 20 minutes, which is a considerable difference at night. And one more consideration that uh, we can look at using that distribution is we can, like I can take the F train instead of the 7 train and then transfer to the 7 eventually. But I never really do that for uh, one big reason. It's that whenever I wait for the F train, I feel like I wait a lot longer. And that's something you can see from the same graph using the F train. The median time is about the same. If, if I go back to the previous slide, uh, Bing Maps <laughs> shows uh, 50 minutes uh, for both of these pads. But uh, I never take the F because it always feels like I'm waiting a lot longer. And that's something you can see here where the 90th percentile in general, like this, this whole band, is just a lot larger than the seven train. So there's like a lot more variability in how long I have to wait for the seven train. I mean, for the F train. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's kind of like a high level overview of the wait times. Uh, and I'm gonna pass it off to Amanda, who's going to give you a more granular look. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda. And just now, Brian gave us kind of an overview of the variance of some of the trains he likes to take. But I will give an overview of the subway system in general, considering some other factors like time of day and uh, day of the week. So there are many factors that can delay the trains, uh, which in turn increases our wait time. So I'm sure as many of you have experienced uh, taking the train during a weekend, uh, waiting for that train takes a lot longer than waiting for it when you go to work. Um, so we want to take a finer look at this variance and see uh, how wait times can vary across subway systems using these following features. So we looked at uh, stations, the line, the day of the week, and the, we broke the hours into these time of day bins, so early morning, morning rush, et cetera. Um, and that just is an interval of certain hours based off that characteristic. Um, and this little data frame we see here, uh, just shows us some results of these predictions that we have. So we could see that typically at the in, oh, sorry, typically for these trains at these stops, which we can't read in English, uh, we wait about two minutes. Uh, but one in every 10 times, we would wait about 17 minutes for the E train. So we wanted to take a bigger look at this variance on the map. So this map shows us um, color-coded by the wait times for green for best wait times and red for worst wait times, uh, each station in New York City. Uh, as we can see, the L and the 7 train tends to have the best uh, waiting times, but overall, uh, some stations are better than others, but overall, typically, it's quite reliable. However, this is the, waste, uh, the worst case predictions, which are important to consider because uh, it happens every so often, like last night when I tried to go home and the two train became two two trains and tripled my wait time. Uh, <laughs> and we also wanted to see if there was any effect with precipitation. So I'm sure most of you would think when it rains, I have to wait so much longer for the train or the train is so much more delayed. Uh, and so we also added precipitation to our model, uh, but we used average precipitation because the Weather uh, data that we gathered was hourly, and we still wanted to keep these kind of time bins, so we just took the average over these time bins. Um, ooh, I did the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Okay. And this map shows our uh, <laughs> predictions from that model with the rain. So. We see here which uh, stations are most sensitive when we add rain um, in terms of expected wait time. And this only shows the stations that have an increase of about um, a minute or so to our median wait time, which is an increase of about 25% of overall median wait time. Um, so yeah, and now that we know more about waiting for the train and how that can vary, I'm going to hand it off to Tashi so he can explain a little more about different commuting options. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so Amanda, Brandon just told us about how long you have to wait to catch a train, and now we want to know how long you will, 
how long the trip will actually take if you catch a train. Um, and we want to know what's the fastest route and what's the most reliable route, and whether the fastest route and the most reliable route are the same route, or maybe what they differ. Um, before, we, before we find a route, we have to pick a source and destination stop. We picked, in this example, we picked the 86th Street and the 6th Ave, and then we find a self candidate path. So that's one path with the B and D line, and that's another path with the 1, 2, 3 line. And then we sort of rec um, rec reconstruct the same path with the historical data we have, just going over and over. And we ev evaluate the trip time based on the historical data. Um, yeah, before we could get the actual trip we take, when you construct the network, and despite the map we're all used to looking at, um, there turns out to be multiple networks depending on the time of day or on whether it's weekend or weekday. Um, that, that's because some trains have different schedules. So here's an example. Um, that's the A train, Lefferts branch. That's the local, and that's express, and that's when during late night. So there's a lot of different variations. And, and that's the final network we have, where every node represents a station, and the weights on the edges represent the average time that it takes from one station to another. We also add the transfer edges. That's when you sort of transfer from the queue to the different line. Yeah, and once we have the graph, we we don't just want to look at the shortest path. We also want we want we kind of want to look at the top ten shortest path, right? And the reason is because the shortest path changes depending on the day, and whether you know this, whether there's a schedule change. And here here's an example that might explain why. Um, the lighter blue dots are the local stops, and the dark blue dots are the express stops. And if you want to get from start to end, here's the three possible paths you might take. You might take the local path all the way, or you might take the you might take the express and then the local path, or you might take the express all the way. And um, so, if you if we use the average time as the weight, the first the first path would take about 12 minutes, and second path would take about 10 minutes, and the third path would take about eight minutes. So you, you assume that the, ex, the express is the fastest route, but then once you consider the wait time, let's say the local train comes in one minute, and the express train comes after four minutes, that kind of changes which one's the shortest path. Then in this case, the first route would take you about 13 minutes, and second one would take you about 14 minutes, and third one take you 12 minutes. That kind of makes the that still makes it there one the fastest, but <laughs> um, but if the wait time changes a bit, you can see how the first one becomes the faster route, and so so that's why we want to find the top ten choice path, and then we analyze this path with the historical data to determine which one's the best in terms of variance and line reliability, which is something that Phoebe is going to talk to you about. Thank you, Tashi. Hi, everyone. My name is Phoebe. And today I will talk to you about the variance and the line reliability. So Tashi told us about how he generated different shortest path on candidates. And let's now actually look at the actual data. And look at the same uh, commute that we're going to have. And this is our actual data frame. The way we're going to, uh, the way we calculate the trip time is we subtract the departure time from the origin, or from the de destination to the origin, and then we have this different uh, in time over here. This chart show you that if you're taking the local train from 96 station to 18 station, it's going to take you on average 18 minutes across 25,000 trips that we looked at. And in the worst case scenario, it's only going to take you 19 minutes. But what if you want to be a winning New Yorker and you want to take the express as far as you could and then you take the local train? Is that save you sometimes or you have to sacrifice your seat on the local train and sweating on the express train? We look at this 96 station and this is all the train that is depart um, from 96 station to 42nd Street from 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. And this is also 
all of the one train start from 42nd Street Station to 18th Street Station. Now, we, we wake up early in the morning and we take the A option, which is um, 8.30 a.m. in the morning. And the next one train that you can catch is at 8.45 minutes. And this is how we construct the trips um, with transfer. You woke up a little bit late and bad luck. You have to wait a little longer to get to the next one train at 42nd Street Station. But that is not always the case that you woke up late, you got to work late. The next option will show you that even though you woke up late, get to the station late, but you can still catch the next one train and get to work on time. So this is the actual itineraries that we generated. And we have, we also calculate the trip time difference in the same method that I, ex um, that I explained previously. Now, to answer the question, are we winning? We look at, we look at the red um, chart over here and we can see that the average time across 17,000 trips is around 30 minutes, uh, sorry, 13 minutes, which is save us about five minutes. However, consider the worst case scenario, it will give you that you will take, uh, it can take above 20 to 30 minutes to get to your destination. So what is the lesson learned? If you want to get to work on time or you need to get to your destination in a certain time frame, take the local. So how about we have the same walking time? Say you stand in the in the middle of the avenue, you can either walk to local one train or you can walk to local B and D train. What line is more reliable? Now, it can be surprising, but it can be not, uh, because the one train turned out to win 80% of the time, and not only it has smaller average, it also has smaller variance, which means most of, most of the time, the one train will get you to the destination faster than the orange, uh, the orange line. And comparing between subway lines is not the only option not the only question that we want to ask. That's why we ha we will compare the subway versus the car, which Peter will talk to you about. Thank you, Phoebe. Hey guys, my name is uh, Peter. And going back to what Phoebe just said about how important variability is, it's very important for um, calculating different subway options. So how do we compare um, how do we compare subway to driving? Which option is faster and which is more reliable? <laughs> yeah. So, Tashi and Phoebe um, discuss how to use past train data to, as a way to analyze how long a train takes to get from one point to the next. So, how would this scenario work when driving? Well, taking a taxi. How, how would we get from one point to an another without having past data? So, the, oops, sorry. <laughs> so this is a very difficult problem. And the way to, way to answer it is by taking another data set, which would create a better approximation. So here we have our tax data, which has over 75 million trips across 2015 from for January to June. And the reason we're using 2015 is because it's the most recent um, data we have that takes in the latitude and longitude, the exact latitude and longitude. So, yeah. And this is a very large data set. It has over 75 million trips. So we want to kind of filter out some trips to make it more, like create small, smaller subsets of these trips. So the way to do it, do it is by this. So we have this data frame, which gives us the pick. For example, there is a trip that takes place at Kips Bay at 11.19. We have the exact pickup latitude and longitude, the exact drop-off latitude and longitude, and the time it takes in minutes. So in order to filter out these trips, we would do so by doing this. So by this very beautiful representation here, we have... <laughs> In this example, we have uh, trips that occur from 96th Street to 14th Street. 
And what's going on here is we're only including trips that occur within 1,000 feet of each station. So for example, we have a trip that starts right here at 96 and ends right here at 14. But we also have trips that start at 96 right here and end somewhere else. And we have a trip right that starts somewhere else and ends at 14. But we don't care about those. We want to care about those that are within the radius of 96 and 14th Street. And this is what it looks like when the, we filter out all the other trips. So here we have an example of comparison of subway versus taxi from 96th Street to Times Square from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. So what this is saying is uh, from this is our um, representation for the train and this is the representation for the taxi. And as you can see, the train has an average trip time of about seven minutes. And the taxi has an average trip time of around 20 minutes. So in this example, it, make, it will make you wonder, why would you take a taxi if the train is a viable option? So another example that a lot of you would probably be familiar with is going to, take, going to the airport. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, um, before that, actually, um, we have another trip from, wait, oh, this is the same slide, sorry. Going to the airport, right? So imagine you live in Midtown and you want to go to JFK. So you would take the E train from this point right here to Jamaica, and then you would take the air train to go to JFK. Or you could take a taxi, but <laughs> <laughs> but which one is the most reliable option? So. From this plot, we can see that on average, a taxi takes around 40 minutes and the train takes around 50 minutes. So it makes you wonder, like, would you pay $60 for a taxi versus 275 for a subway for just 10 minutes of left travel time apart? So what this is showing here, that if, if you're running late, it would, your best bet would be to take the taxi versus if you have more time to spare, you, a train would be the best option. And here we have the same example, but from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., which is rush hours. So as you can see, the distribution of the um, train is very similar to what we had before. However, the taxi is much slower due to traffic, as you can see. So the train is definitely the most viable option when you're in rush hours. And now uh, I'd like to hand off to Eliana, who is talking about commute maps. Uh, thank you, Peter. So um, I'm going to be talking about commuting options. Hi, I'm Eliana. Um, <laughs> so, so far we've talked about where you have a starting destination and an ending destination. And you're trying to figure out what's the shortest time between those two. Well, let's say we don't have a starting destination. For example, I'm trying to decide where to live. I just got a job in New York City, hooray, um, 14th Street, Union Square, and I'm trying to decide where to move to. So New York City is a very big place, and you know, I have lots of options, but I want to make sure my commute is not too long every day. So I can say I like the Upper East Side. So I'll, using Tashi's technique that he showed you before with the graph, we're going to use K Shores Path, generate this, um, 72nd Street to 14th, Street, um, Union Square, 28 minute commute. Sounds good. It's pretty nice. But what if I'm a broke college student and can't afford the Upper East Side? What are my other options? So to do that, we um, mapped from each station to 14th Street, Union Square, um, about 500 stations throughout New York City, and did this um, map that shows you the com median commute time from each of those stations to 14th Street, Union Square. So for example, um, down here in uh, Brooklyn, you see there's about like a 45 minute commute time and up here in Queens is also about 45 minutes. But you're hopefully not living right on top of a subway station. So what happens in between? Like we have to fill in the, this gap here, 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 you know, all the gaps between subway stations. So I'm going to use a toy example to illustrate how we did that. So that's me. Um, I'm trying to get to that endpoint. I can either go to the blue subway station or the orange subway station. 
So the blue one is a two minute walk away. The orange one's a three minute walk away. Okay, maybe I'll just walk to the two minute one, the blue one. It seems faster walk, just get on the subway. But now we have to consider how long the subway trip takes. So that's the local train, eight minute subway commute. Um, versus we have the orange one, which is a three minute subway commute. So it ends up being a 10 minute total commute on the blue versus a six minute total commute on the orange. So the orange one wins. And so the shortest path from uh, where I am to the end is through taking the orange um, line. So we did this across New York City for about 25,000 points, and we got this map. So you can see that, again, in Brooklyn, you have about a 45-minute commute time, and then out in Queens, you also have about 45 minutes. Down here in Far Rockaway, you have about like 100 minutes, maybe not a good option. Um, but with this map, we still have a problem. This is the median commute time which means you'll get there on time to work half the time. And maybe you shouldn't be getting to work um, late every other day. So now we have to consider another option, another factor, which is how much time do you need to add to your commute, like buffer time, to say, OK, like add extra 10 minutes, and that 10 minutes will be if the train's running late one day. So this is our map we made. And you can see that um, you know, in the best points, like the green, it's only an extra five minutes. But you know, out there in Queens, where your commute is already like an hour or 45 minutes, you still need to add an extra 30 minutes to make sure you're on time um, most of the time, which in this case would be you'd be getting to work late um, about uh, once every two weeks. And for that, you can just blame that on the subway. Not a big deal. The other question that I had is if you look up there by the Bronx um, up there, you see there's the red line and the uh, yellow line. Now, those seem somewhat equidistant from 14th Street Union Square. So what's happening there? So the yellow one is actually the one train. And the red, the part where it's red, where it's an extra 30 minutes, is actually the four train. Um, so the one train, according to the experts, is a lot more um, reliable than the four train. So if you're going to be choosing between those two options, you might want to take um, the option where the one train is versus the four train. So you won't have to add as much buffer time every day. So I talked about what happens if the subway graph is fully functional, everything's working like it should. But what happens when something comes to disrupt it? And that's what Sasha is going to tell you about. Thanks, Eliana. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sasha. And as Eliana said, I'm going to be talking to you about how our commute times and commute options change uh, when our subway system is modified. Um, so a quick question for the audience. How many of you are frequent L train uh, takers? Fair amount, OK. Um, so for those of you who aren't that familiar with the L train, um, the train runs across lower Manhattan along 14th Street into Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and then down into Brooklyn. Um, so it's a very, very uh, easy way to commute between the two locations. Um, so for those of you who do know a lot about the L train, can you tell the audience what's going to be happening next year? <laughs> Shut down for 15 months. Completely shut down. Also, I will point out that it is going to shut down for many weekends, starting really soon, running from basically now until April as well. Great. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> so yes, exactly. Um, this has been a plan for a couple of years now, and starting in April, um, the MTA, MTA is planning to stop service from uh, 8th Ave and Bedford Ave uh, on the L. Um, so, uh, you know, the MTA does have plans to make this transition a little easier. Um, they're planning to add more bus routes, add new bike lanes, um, and add an increased service at uh, subway stations that are around the L. But we want to know uh, what happens to our commute options when we only consider the subway as our transportation. So here we have an example commute. Um, we want to travel from this green dot, that's Brooklyn Winery in Williamsburg, to uh, Union Square, uh, that's the red dot. And this is what our shortest path looks like with the L. Very easy, just one train straight across. Um, but we, when we take out those six stops from our map, our shortest commute looks something like this. Um, yeah. <laughs> looks very out of the way, um, not too good. Uh, now let's take a closer look at the times. 
So with the L, it looks like we only have to walk two minutes to the Bedford Ave stop. Um, we have an expected wait time, worst case, of six minutes. Uh, and then our, our, our train, um, our L train, will take about seven minutes, and then we'll be at our destination. Um, and that gives us a grand total of 15 minutes, not too bad. But when we look at our commute without the L, <laughs> now we have to walk six minutes to a totally new station, totally new line. We have to take three different trains, and our total commute ends up being around 47 minutes. Um, and this is, this is worst case, um, but we always want to plan for that. <laughs> um, so given this one commute, we see how our uh, travel time ends up uh, getting bumped up by about half an hour. Um, but we'd like to see what other areas would be affected by this. So if we map the, uh, if we create a heat map of the differences in commute time, we see that this red area, that's uh, where the Bedford Ave station is, and they're going to experience this most severely. Their commute time is going to go up about 30 minutes, um, and we see that it gets less and less severe as we go down, even though the L train still runs there, but that's because uh, commuters will have a, an earlier chance to transfer um, before getting to their destination. Um, and you would probably think that this would discourage some people from uh, moving to Williamsburg. I know there are a few people planning on doing that. Um, but it seems that the cool kids keep flocking to Brooklyn uh, regardless. Um, so that's what happened uh, to our commute when we took something out of our map. But what about when we add something to our map? Um, so starting in 2020, uh, the MTA plans to um, add a new air train that connects the subway to LaGuardia Airport. Um, and their plan is to connect the 7 and the LIRR at Metz Willits Point uh, to the airport with this uh, 1.5 mile long uh, track. Um, and that trip will take about six minutes. Um, right, right over there. So the claim is that this will get, uh, this will get you from Midtown to LaGuardia under 30 minutes. Um, we see from our map that that's not really the case. Uh, it still looks like it'll take you about 45, 55 minutes. Um, that under 30 minute thing is true when you take the LIRR, but since we're only, only looking at subway maps, uh, this is kind of what we want to take a look at. And according to um, some other experts in the room, um, that 45, 55 minute trip seems pretty on par with your, your taxi trip. Um, so you might as well just take the subway and save a few bucks. Um, and so the last thing I'd like to talk to you about is how our commutes change uh, across demographic groups. And I'd like to break this down into two parts. The first, looking at um, those who require accessible stations. And I'd also like to talk to you about how medium, median household income affects commute time. Um, so on the left-hand side, it might be a little hard to see in the back, um, but we have a commute map to 14th Street um, when, when all stations are available, available to us. And on the right-hand side, we have a commute map uh, when only accessible stations are available to us. And we see around Manhattan, it's pretty much the same. It's pretty well covered. Um, but there are some areas where we are lacking in accessible stations, mainly over here and down here. Um, and to make this a little clearer, we can see uh, what neighborhoods we kind of want to avoid if we are in need of accessible stations. Um, so that would be down here in Brooklyn and in Far Rockaway, um, where your commute time would go up about 50 to 60 minutes. Um, and lastly, uh, the New York Times published this article about two months ago or so um, with a headline saying, Sub subway delays hit low-income New Yorkers the hardest. Um, and this makes sense, you know, um, areas that have very good uh, subway access tend to be higher income neighborhoods. Um, so we want to see how true this was. And so using our commute maps from earlier and census data, we see that there is this relationship in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens. We see that the, uh, with an increase in median household income, there is a decrease in um, median trip time. And this is to 34th Street also. Um, 
So for example, we see that in Manhattan, a $50,000 increase in income is associated with about a seven minute incre uh, sorry, decrease in commute time. Um, you might be wondering what's happening with the Bronx. Um, we notice something different there, uh, kind of the opposite relationship. Um, and we, we were wondering why this was, and luckily we have uh, two members of our class who are from the Bronx, so we asked them what's going on there. And when we mapped out um, the Bronx, Bronx and Manhattan, we kind of see uh, where this is coming from. So the green is Manhattan, and this is our boundary between Bronx and Manhattan. And the dark purple dots are areas or neighborhoods that have uh, median household income of at least $75,000. Um, so we see that those areas are more residential, and it explains why they're trading off this uh, their commute time uh, in this way. All right, so I would just like to uh, hand it off back to Akbar to wrap it up for us. Thank you, Sasha. Oops. So I just want to close the loop. We've come full circle and talk about some of the key uh, takeaways from tonight. So we learned that small changes to the system can have large effects. If you shut down one line, you can add up to 30 minutes to a commute. Averages are misleading. Variance is king. It can change your commute by nearly 50%. And despite recent reports, subways are typically quite reliable, and they can beat taxis to JFK in rush hour by 10 minutes and save 60 bucks. So we also wanted to talk about one last uh, bonus graph, which is actually about um, the E-train from 5th and 53rd Street to JFK. And we'll notice that the average is around 35 minutes. But one thing that I thought was pretty interesting about this, um, this graph was that it looked pretty familiar to me. So I thought I would give it a face. <laughs> Who recognizes that? <laughs> um, and before we open up to questions, I just wanted to give a thank you from all the DS3 students to Jake, Dan, Sid, all our mentors, and everybody at MSR who's made this possible. And thank you all for coming and watching our talk. <laughs> Are there any questions? So um, we actually have the minimal transfer time, and we also have the wait time from Amanda and Brian and Peter. Okay. So we should combine them into the edge way. And that's how we do it. Cool. Did you guys come across information on why some lines are more uh, reliable um, than some of the other ones? Do we have like taxi cab drivers? Some of those trains or yeah. Well, so, so what's going on is there are a bunch of different things that are going on in that space. So we have uh, two, two lines specifically, the L train and the 7 train. They're slightly more, they're like usually more reliable than other trains, and that's largely because they're on a system called CBTC. The L train is completely on it, whereas the 7 train is only partially on it. And what that means, uh, CBTC may, makes, the, uh, the, makes the process for trains coming and going automated, whereas now it, there, it requires kind of a conductor or an operator to slow down at stations and to when to leave. Yeah. And it is also because the 7 train and the L train. It is also because the 7 train and the L train is running on its own track, so it doesn't shake with any track, so that's why it's called less delay. Back. So first of all, this is really, really cool, uh, and thank you guys for being <laughs> so good about presenting it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Um, the second uh, is actually a question, um, and I, I wanted to know if you guys looked at what, if any, relationship existed between median ho or between household income and variance in wait times. I'll hand that off to Sasha. <laughs> and if, yeah, I guess if if not, and uh, you guys. But are thank you for such a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I believe we looked at the median. Um, I do remember also creating a similar plot using uh, the 90th percentile, um, and there actually wasn't much difference. 
Um, but we didn't actually look specifically at <coughs> variants. Uh, but that is a great thing to look at. So <laughs> further work. <laughs> So we did find a lot of trains. Like so, all the multiple trains had different levels of variance. And like we were talking about before, like the L train, the seven train, they were usually more reliable. Some of the less reliable trains were like the four, five, six. Oh, well, not the six actually, but the four and five, uh, as well as the B and D. <laughs> yeah. And the N train. And the N train. <laughs> when uh, when you're considering uh, taxis uh, against. Um, uh, the subway. Mm -hmm. Did you think about weather at any point? I know you at one point thought about rain, uh, but do you look at that at any point when you're just comparing the two? Uh, I will hand this off to Peter. Great question. <laughs> uh, yeah, good question, but uh, no, we didn't consider it. <laughs> <laughs> In some cases, your tax is going to be a lot quicker, but then when it's raining, you might be better off with the subway because, you know, traffic when in rain is terrible. So I just thought about that. Yeah, you know? yeah. that makes sense, though, yeah. <laughs> there was uh, one more data point or one type of data that would really tie things together for you. What is the one thing you really wish that you could access to? Yeah, that's a, that's a very loaded question. We can question. go around it. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere. I, I mean, uh, early on when we were like brainstorming and everything, I, I had like an interesting idea where um, we wanted to take in like Uber and like Lyft data because like uh, their prices vary based on like the time of day or anything like that. And I wanted to see like if the delays uh, affect any of the pricing on Uber or Lyft. <laughs> um, so one more data set that we really want to consider is the turnstile data, which means how many people swipe on the uh, to get in, in the train, and it can cause a causal um, another causal inference question. Maybe because uh, if the train is very crowded, does that delay? Um, does that cause more delays? Um, however, the data set is in four hour time frame compared to what we have over here is minute level time frame. Um, so. That is something we want to add on if we have a chance. Uh, so there was one point where I was trying to look at uh, station level wait times rather than by route um, that I showed earlier for the predictions. And one of the worst things with this data was that there was no global stop sequence. Uh, so we had to do a lot of work to kind of put in order from the beginning stop of a route to the last stop. Uh, just a general global route that usually exists. We had a lot of weird things where there was half routes, quarter routes, starting and disappearing routes, and we had to kind of just make up a bunch of stuff to get one consecutive <laughs> route or stop sequence. Um, another thing that I think would have helped in that regard is being able to know what type of route it was. Like we could filter out for day and time, but that doesn't give us the exact information that we were looking for in that like is this a more is this a rush hour schedule? Is this a late night schedule? Is this a, a service schedule? That's something that we didn't really kind of we didn't have that information and so we had to kind of make assumptions about it by filtering out for that. Uh, another thing that we wanted to consider was uh, alternative commute, like Brian was talking about Uber, uh, Lyft, but also like the NYC ferry and city bike. <laughs> And that would have been a great way to kind of analyze the the full scope of your different commuting options. Go ahead. Um, did you also consider uh, how maintenance budgets affect reliability and variance? So that was something we considered. It was harder to kind of put that into data. The just the data set was kind of harder to put together. Uh, so it's something that we would love to do for future work, but it was for the time that we had, it wasn't. Uh, wasn't kind of viable. It's a common thing that you hear, common mm -hmm. comment, is that oh, the MTA is raising prices mm -hmm. again. Where are they putting the money? Mm -hmm. Are they doing the maintenance on, yeah. on the trains and the stations? And how does that affect the commute? Mm -hmm. One of the questions that we had earlier on was how does uh, how does actual service uh, like if if a train has gone down for service, how reliable is it afterwards? But that also has other layers in that. Is it the same? Was it supposed to be the same? Is it supposed to be better? You know. 
Uh, this might be a bit of a lengthy question, so I might ap apologize for the difficulty beforehand. But uh, during your, your research, have you had a chance to compare MTA data with a uh, on a subway system from across the country? Oh, I wanted to, but we couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Amanda answered, uh, we wanted to, but we didn't really have the time given the scope of the project. It's something we would love to do. <laughs> Are we the worst yet? Are we the worst one? <laughs> According to news reports, sometimes we are. <laughs> I will hand this off to Sasha. <laughs> uh, that came from uh, census data, I believe from 2016 or so. Um, and that broke it down into, we were able to break it down to neighborhoods and stuff like that. To, to piggyback on that question, I saw that you, uh, you were comparing um, median income versus how it's going to affect your commute time, like all the, the or three boroughs you had up there. And Queens seemed to be the fairest. Mm -hmm. Is that because Queens has kind of the, the greatest mix? Is it the most checkered? Yeah, that's, that's what it seemed um, when doing a similar plot uh, that I had with the Bronx where we plotted uh, where they were higher income. It seemed kind of, you know, there were some kind of by the water, some more in, so very checkered. Uh, when you guys were mentioning data related to inclement weather and how that adds on to delays in the train system, did you separate it between underground stations and above ground stations and seeing whether or not there was a major difference in delays? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was actually one of the first things we did, and we found that there really wasn't a difference between above ground and below ground stations, contrary to Jake's popular belief. I didn't think, <laughs> I didn't think there was going to be a difference, but he was really hoping there was, and there wasn't. <laughs> Any more questions? Sorry, Jake. Uh, I have a question. Uh, basically, I saw you look at a, a lot of like median income data, you know, those kind of cost pricing, maybe you probably look at that. So I read some article before. I saw that uh, there's a lot of people talk about the correlation between the rental and rental price mm -hmm. and the basic commute time. Mm -hmm. Even some people write a formula. You know, you can calculate. You know, based on how much you spend, you can have expect like how much commute time you have. Yeah. So when I think about this, I feel like when you look at the house, you know, the rich people might not take subway. You know, <laughs> or you know, yeah. look at median price mm -hmm. maybe you know, the high-income people, they won't take subway. So there's a lot of bias there. Yeah. So I would think if you look at the, you know, rental price, rental data, that might be more useful. Great idea. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm curious as to how feasible you think it would be to take, like, this, the data science that y'all could and turn it into a tool. I imagine that, like, a lot of people outside of this room would really want to use this. So we we actually you? have some of the code in progress for Sweet. developing tools that allow you to do this with your commute. Great. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, all of our research is open open source. You can see it on GitHub. <laughs> Once again, thank you for your time.